Nautilus Files here and welcome back to another edition of Severance Theories. In part 4 of this series, we'll delve into the lives of the denizens of the Perpetuity Wing and examine the Egan family, specifically its CEOs past and present. We have a lot to discuss here, so let's not waste any time with the preamble and get straight into it. But as always, I need to warn any newcomers to the channel that my videos are spoiler heavy. I'll be talking about specific characters and events that take place in the show, so if you'd like to avoid that, now is your chance to save this video for later and come back and watch it when you're good and ready. So, the Egans. One thing we can say about them is that the Egans take the saying, keep it in the family, to heart. From what we can tell, every CEO at Lumen has been a member of the family from its founding onward, with Keir Egan being the first. So let's start with what we know about Keir. Keir, aka the grandfather, aka the chosen one, was born in 1841 to parents who had close biological relationship. This is kind of a nice way of saying that he was somewhat inbred. And because of this, he was born with some abnormalities in the form of a skin condition that left him easily bruised. At a very young age, he contracted tuberculosis, a bacterial infection of the lungs. It was characterized by a chronic cough with bloody mucus, fever, and severe weight loss. Young Keir survived this disease and took on his first job working for a man named Edgar Willett, a furniture maker at the age of 12. This was 1853, so it wasn't unusual for a kid his age to work a manual labor job, as crazy as that sounds today. Keir makes mention of Edgar in his handbook, describing him as a violent man who had a predilection for beating his workers with the leg of a dresser. Again, I stress that this is mid 19th century. The experience of working for such a person apparently had a significant impact on him in his formative years and played a part in the evolution of his ideological views that later on became the foundational aspects of Lumen. Here met Imogene, a swab girl, while working as a stew man in an ether factory and the two were married. We don't hear much else about Imogene. The only thing we do get is this dramatized depiction of her in this painting in optics and design. Here spent some time as a military doctor in his 20s, serving in the Civil War, most likely. After witnessing the carnage that war does to man, Keir sought for answers in pharmaceuticals to help ease the suffering of his fellow human beings. Thus, Lumen was born. The company started in 1865 and flourished, eventually becoming the mega corporation it is currently. The most important thing to understand about Keir's legacy is his view of service, or the idea of doing work for the benefit of others. He believed it to be the highest form of love, and the core principles of his belief might read off like the Ten Commandments, but they act as a reminder for those who are in service that intention matters. For Kier, work was a virtuous and spiritual act. Kier's idea of the four tempers, woe, dread, frolic, and malice, are derived from his observations of the human condition, believing that by controlling or subduing these destructive forces within the human heart, a person could reach a kind of nirvana, or as he put it, the world shall become but your appendage. Kier's intentions appear to be genuine. While Kier's ideas seem harmless and may in fact be a good rule of thumb, it's easy to see how these could be perverted into something not unlike a tool, a coercion, or obedience within a modern corporation. So let's get into some of the other CEOs at Lumen. So we have Ambrose Egan. He takes over as the second CEO at Lumen after Keir's death in 1939, but only serves for a few years, ending in 1941. Ambrose is known as the black sheep of the Egan family, but we're never told exactly why that is. Myrtle Egan is the third CEO of Lumen, beginning her tenure in 1941 and ending in 1959. She's the first female CEO at Lumen. In episode 6 of Severance, we get a shot of the Myrtle Egan School for Girls in Harmony's little altar shrine thing. This school is probably run or founded by Myrtle. Born in 1902, Baird was the CEO from 1959-1976. This guy looks like a CEO. Gerhard Egan, the fifth Egan CEO serving from 1976 to 1987. Another Egan we don't know much about other than the fact that he had exceptional eyebrows. Pip served as CEO after Gerhard from 1987 through 1999. We get a reference to him in Pip's Bar and Grill, a diner where company employees are gifted with meals in the VIP section whenever something goes awry inside Lumen. What exactly is a, a VIP section in a diner? And anyway. Leonora Egan, the seventh CEO at Lumen, served from 1999 to 2003. She has a lake named after her in the town of Kier, Lake Leonora. And finally, James Egan, not James, James, I know, current Lumen CEO, 
Jane wears a pinky ring that has the old school Lumen logo on it. We can guess a few things about this character based on some clues we were given, but as far as indisputable facts, we have not much to go on there, other than the fact that we know he is physically frail, and possibly bedridden, and quite up in age. We'll get to this character more when we get into the theory side of things. Would you look at that? It is time for the theory side of things. Let's start with the name of the hall where these creepy Egan statues exist, the Perpetuity Wing. The root word for perpetuity, perpetual, implies endlessness. In any other situation, this would be figurative. In other words, these people will be immortalized in history as legend never to fade from our collective memories. Or maybe it's referring to the idea that the statues themselves will never be taken down. But this is Lumen, where a break room is a bit more literal than you might expect. Could it be that the namesake is a not so subtle hint that the CEOs in this room are still alive somehow? Let's run it back to the final episode where James Egan says this. And one day, you will sit with me at my revolving. That line, and the line where he says, history lives in us all whether we learn it or not, support the idea that the Egans exist in some fashion, if we take them to have double meaning. This lines up with the theory that Jame is the host to the entire Egan pantheon of CEOs, which is a great segue into the next theory. The board as we know it is, well, rude. They never say much. In fact, we don't even get so much as a greeting or a great job. They speak through Natalie most of the time, and the one time we do hear them, it sounds like the death rattle of a dying corpse over an intercom. The weird thing is, that weak, wilted voice sounds a lot like Jame, when we hear him at the gala speaking to Helena. Jame is said to be unwell, and spends a lot of time in bed. If the past CEOs are the board, then Jame would be the only voice able to speak on their behalf. Thus, the weird silence is when the board is addressed over the comm. Maybe he can't speak sometimes. James also talks about an upcoming event called a revolving, a word that evokes the idea of turning or taking turns. He also said Heli would be at his side when this occurs, as if it was an honor for her to experience as a reward for her loyalty to the family. There is enough here to believe that Heli is next in line to be CEO of Lumen, and that this revolving is a ceremony in conjunction with that special event. If James is a host for a chip carrying the minds of the past CEOs, then it's reasonable to believe that Heli will be the new host, housing all of the past CEOs, including her father, James. I just imagined having my parents living in my head, and I got the biggest chill down my spine. Hard pass. If you spent any time in the forums related to Severance, you will no doubt have heard about some of the theories that question whether there is anyone else besides Heli that is related to the Egans. In my character analysis video on Harmony Coble, I briefly touch on the topic, suggesting that there is the possibility that Harmony is related to the Egans. This theory exists because of the connection she has to them through attending the Myrtle Egan School for Girls as a child. Personally, I would say there is an even chance that this one's true. There's also a theory that Mark could be an Egan. Harmony shows a great deal of concern for Audi Mark and disdain for any Mark. At first, I thought she was just keeping an eye on him as part of her duties, you know, taking work home with her, pardon the pun. But when you look at how she acts around him, she's acting out of genuine concern at times. Now, this could be because she knows what Mark is or who he is, even though he himself is unaware of it. If Mark is an Egan, then the same would be true of Devin, his sister. Also, if Mark is an Egan, then it's unlikely that Harmony is also an Egan. I say this because in the milk and cookie scene, she actually tries to hit on Mark, making him aware of her <laughs> availability. She probably wouldn't have done that in order to avoid any more of that close biological relationship business. Okay, so I have saved the best for last. This is not an easy one to explain, so bear with me. But this one posits that Rickon is the real Egan. Let me preface this by shouting out Trish D for pointing out this little fact to me. But Harmony makes a statement regarding Rickon's book that is very, very interesting. When she brings the book back to the office, she mentions that it is Rickon's fifth book. Seems innocuous at first, but when you think about it, who keeps track of how many books an author has written? I mean, I could see if she was a super fan, which she clearly isn't. I follow a few authors myself, tweets, book signings and all, but I couldn't tell you how many books any of them have written offhand. This statement could imply that she knows exactly who Rickon is, and she's keeping track of him and Devin for a reason. Maybe because they aren't just random citizens of Kier P.E. So what do we know about Rickon for sure? 
Rickon comes from a well-to-do family that basically gave him a pile of cash and kicked him out of the nest to find his voice. Now, Rickon is clearly not a character meant to be taken seriously, but that might be the entire point behind his silly presentation. Chernus was a great cast for this role, by the way. Just had to throw that in there. What clues do we have pointing to Rickon being an Egan? Not a whole lot, but when you examine Rickon in Devin's home, you'll note that there are several references to goats there, and that certainly cannot be coincidental. I've seen a few theories that explain that Rickon is basically kind of a Christ-like character. And you can liken his new book as the New Testament in relation to Kier's Old Testament. This sort of makes sense when you consider how much Severance borrows from religious themes. Much of what Rickon says in his book aligns with Kier's original views, but not with what Lumen is doing now. It's fitting that Rickon's book is catalytic in effect when it comes to the changes that it spurs within the members of MDR. It brings about a new way of looking at what they already believe. Imagine Lumen as the corporation that strays from Kier's vision for mankind, taking on a corporatized view where wealth and power become the ulterior motive rather than the virtues extolled by Kier. Lumen has lost its way, using faith as a means to manipulate adherents into service for them. Rickon, in his own goofy way, is the savior meant to free those severed people trapped in Lumen's great big machine. Okay, that one was heavy. Perhaps the tenfold cap is a bit tight, but I really like this theory regardless, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's some truth to it. I think in the end we are going to find out that Rickon is much more than what he seems, but we'll have to wait until season two to find out for sure. Well, we covered quite a bit here. I hope you enjoyed the video. There's some new things coming to the channel that I'll be announcing pretty soon. Hey, I put out a survey to see what you guys, other kinds of shows you guys are interested in. Now, if you haven't seen it, you can go check in the community page and you can give your vote or you're saying what you would like to see. I'm trying to get an idea of what you guys like besides this show. Probably things that are similar, I would guess. I watch a lot of different things, so I'm open to a lot. I'm not gonna make any more announcements. <laughs> because I don't want to lock myself into anything I won't be able to do later. So that's it for this video. Once again, I hope you enjoyed it. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you guys next time. And until then, off you go.